for me. And so that's a benefit of opening the Word of God today. Something else that happens when we preach the Word of God is that God does things that are supernatural. Last week, actually, we took a little hiatus out of our study in Romans, and we preached in 1 Corinthians, and we looked at the kind of things that God chooses to use in order for the gospel to be preached. And the 1 Corinthians, Paul said it this way at the Church of Corinth. He said, not many mighty, not many noble are called. And then he said, for God hath chosen, uh, God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, and weak things to confound the, uh, the mighty. And he said, base things and things that are despised hath God chosen. And then Paul uses a little segue and says, by the way, that's you that I'm talking about. Weak, despised, foolish, and God uses you to preach the gospel in power in such a way that people get saved. And the reason for it is that no flesh should glory in His presence. Friend, when you really get to know who God is, you recognize that the foolishness of God is wiser than men. The weakness of God is stronger than men. And that's one of the things that we expect to happen when the Word of God is preached, is that God is going to do things that man's wisdom couldn't do. God's going to do things that man's strength could not do. And ultimately, no flesh will be able to glory. We're not going to be able to say, I did that. We'll have to say, God did that. And friend, if you're here today and God does something in your life, isn't that a wonderful opportunity? Wouldn't that be marvelous if you came here and God did something? If a pastor did something here today, you'll forget about it. It won't matter. But if God does something, it'll change your life. So I hope you're here today to have your life changed. Here we are, Romans chapter 15, beginning at verse 1. The Bible says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself. Well, that's an understatement. But as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scripture might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grants you to be like-minded one toward another, toward another, according to Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let's pray and we'll ask God to help us to know how to perform what is promised. Father, I pray that you would help us to understand your word today. And Lord, I just ask that in, in every way possible, that personality that is human would be taken away from the preaching of your word today. And I pray that instead, God, that we would desire first in our hearts to have you stir us, mm -hmm. to have you, uh, God, show us things that your spirit could use to convince us to want to live more for Jesus, to want to be effective as part of your church. And ultimately, God, I pray that we would not leave this place the same as we as we came here today. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Paul is concluding in verse 1 of chapter 15 the passage of Scripture that is always preached on Christian liberty. You know what I'm talking about? Christian liberty. I went to I, I confess I'm not a I'm not a fellowshipper or a conventioner and I'm not part of any camp. I mean I believe that autonomy, if you're a Baptist here today, we've mentioned it a couple times. One of the things Baptists believe in is Bible authority, which means that really we reject man's authority. We believe in God's authority. And we believe in autonomy as well, which means that because we don't have apostles today, we, we do have apostles today, but because apostles today are the Word of God, because the apostles are the Word of God and they're the foundation for the church, then the church is built on Christ, our cornerstone, the foundation which the apostles and prophets, that's the Word of God, and so no one can make a phone call to Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church and say we're going to make some changes there. Can't happen. Why? Because the Word of God is what makes changes at Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church, and we function independently from other churches. I'm not angry at anybody or against anybody, but I'm not a fellowshipper with other churches. By that, I don't mean that I don't fellowship. I have a lot of friends who are pastors in ministry, but I don't have time to mind other people's business and to carry on the work of the ministry here. It's pretty tough to build a church in Fort Lauderdale, Miami Beach, and Marathon, where we started our churches. It's 
pretty tough to do that without getting into all kinds of other things. And so we really kind of mind our own business here. We just we try to do the work of the ministry here and pay attention to that. That's that's what we uh, what we believe. Now, so I'm not a fellowshipper. I'm not one of these people that you know goes to fellowships. But I did a couple of years ago. Go, uh, I was I was on vacation. I was visiting my parents, and their church had a fellowship, and it was in July. And so for their fellowship, they had a theme. I, I, I'm just not used to this. Some of you folks, you know, you go to these sort of things. I don't. I just go to church. This is my church. This is where, this is where I fellowship. But they had a, a theme. A bunch of preachers came together, and they had a theme. The theme was liberty. And this was the passage of Scripture that everybody there today preached. And so it was, it was 4th of July. And so they, were, they had taken American rights and American holidays, and they had kind of taken... Uh, Romans 14 about and and preach Christian liberty on it and that's that's the theme of the conference and I went away from that thing I wish somebody had preached the Bible today because I didn't hear the Word of God preached they preached a theme and uh, it really wasn't preaching because I didn't feel as though and again I'm not trying to be judgmental or unkind but I didn't feel as though the Word of God was preached I have heard a lot of messages like that preached from Romans 14 which begins with him that is weak in the faith receive ye but not to doubtful dispensations for one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. So I've heard a lot of things preached that as I study Romans 14, I don't find there. One thing I've heard preached, what did I say? It's not Romans 14? Yeah, Romans 14 is, is the one I just read, right? Oh, yeah, here it is. Yeah. Boy, Larry, I was oh, right I was once. 15. Well, our text is chapter 15, but I'm talking about Romans 14. Is everybody confused by that or just Larry? Did I, did I, did I leave everybody behind? So, okay. Okay. All right. Larry knows what chapter I was talking about, so he's ahead of us. But he's just like, I thought, we, I thought Romans 15 was our text. Stay in your text. I am a, I'm in our context. We're in the introduction of what we're preaching today. Okay. So here we are. Uh, so, him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. That is in Romans chapter 14. Paul is explaining to the church that there are some people who have what he calls uh, a weakness. And the word for it actually also means sick. Okay? Um, it, when you study it, now here's what I've been told. I've been told, well, they're talking about meat offered to idols. Some people in the church thought it was okay to go to the marketplace and to buy meat that had already been sacrificed to the goddess Diana or something like that. And then after the goddess, god or goddess didn't eat the meat, then they took it, recycled it, and sold it. Well, actually, it isn't talking about that. I've heard that preached almost every time. I've read a commentary every time. I've heard Romans 14 preached, but you don't find it anywhere in the text. And if you read Acts chapter 15, you find that the individual that the Holy Spirit used to pen Romans, that is the Apostle Paul, was part of the apostles at Jerusalem, who one of the things that they required Gentiles not to do was to eat meat offered to idols. So Romans 14 is not saying, hey, you can eat meat offered to idols as long as you've got a clear conscience about it. No, the Bible strictly forbids believers to eat meat offered to idols. I recognize that the Apostle Paul said, you know, one day man esteemeth one day above another, another man esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. And he illustrates by saying that some people think that this is this, and some people think it's that. And you better, but you better have a reason for what you believe, and you better do it unto the Lord if you do it. But if you take that logic and misapply it, it would be like this. Uh, does alcohol, does alcohol have any good purposes? If you're a drag racer, it does. Right? Uh, <laughs> uh, should you drink it? Does, does strychnine, strychnine have any good purposes? Yes. Um, does is dirt good? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if if you're trying to grow plants and stuff, okay. The idea that you can take anything and consume it just because it exists is nonsensical. You know, marijuana has a useful purpose. I, I'm not, I'm not not talking about smoking it. You know, marijuana they grew to make hemp, make rope out of. It's actually a useful plant. You know, but I remember counseling a teenager who was 15 years old, been arrested for marijuana. He was forced to come in to, for counseling, which is probably not real effective. Uh, 
But he told me, he said, it's a weed. God made it. It's a plant. God made it. So yeah, but God didn't make you smoke it. You know? So strychnine has purposes, but I'm not going to eat it. Uh, some things are good for some things, but that doesn't mean I'm going to consume them. You understand that? Paul is not saying everything is good to eat. No, he's saying everything is good. That is not uh, God made is good. The Bible says that about things. I've had Christians take and, and use this passage of Scripture for immorality. The Bible says in Hebrews 13 that marriage is uh, honorable in all. In other words, God has relationships, God has things that are good in marriage. But they're not good somewhere else. The misapplication of something that God makes good is immoral. And so you and I need to use our brains when we talk about Christian liberty, when we hear people talking about I'm telling you, it was big when I was growing up. It was big when I was growing up for people to say, oh, you're a legalist. You're trying to put people under the law. You're trying to make people comply with a standard and you're, you're making laws and rules. No, friend, that's when you are trying to put people under the law and you're making laws and rules. But when God's Word says something like, abstain from meat offered to idols in Acts chapter 15, then God says we're not supposed to eat meat offered to idols. Therefore, Romans 14 is not saying you can do whatever you want to. Right? Okay, now, I'm not going to preach Romans 14 today. We're in Romans chapter 15. We're going back to the theme that we've been looking at in Romans. We, we saw in the beginning that this church at Rome is a unique church in that in a day when most of the churches around the world would have been understood to be primarily Jewish, at least at their foundation or their beginning, yet many of the churches, like the church at Rome, had become a mixed church. Paul had never been to Rome when, he, when by the uh, inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he penned this letter. And yet he's writing to a church that's there. How did the church at Rome come to be, come into existence? And how did they come into existence with a makeup of Jews and Gentiles? Remember the Romans 1.16 when Paul is introducing his letter? He said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greeks. How did this church at Rome get to be Jews and Gentiles without the apostle to the Gentiles to start the church? Logic follows that the Jews preached the gospel at Rome and Gentiles got saved and they all became part of the church. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Isn't that wonderful? And then it created friction because the Gentiles were still not Jews. They were believers. Remember to Antioch when the Gentiles got saved and, and had, were filled with the Holy Spirit for the first time and believers were called Christians first at Antioch? The, the Gentile believers were Christians, Christ followers. But they were not genetically morphed into Jews. And so now the Jews who understand, hey, Jesus was Jewish, and, and uh, Jesus is really the, is the Messiah of Israel, that is who He is, they were frustrated by the fact that the Gentiles were not being good Jews. They were uncircumcised. And the Jews thought, well, if we have to be circumcised, why oughtn't they, or why shouldn't they? And they, were, and they were not obeying the law of Moses. And I'm not talking about the Ten Commandments. I'm talking about the law of Moses, all the commandments. And it created a friction in the church. Uh, the Gentiles didn't even have the basic knowledge. You know, if you're Jewish, you grew up being taught the laws, being, uh, being taught how to live. I mean, the Gentiles didn't even have, can you imagine, just how many things about the Gentiles would have been absolutely abhorrent to their Jew, to their Gentile counter or to their Jewish counterparts, you have a dinner, and I mean Gentiles are just being like animals, you know, in the minds of the Jews. Everything they do is offensive, and uh, they they don't even understand the cultures and the customs and so forth. And the Jews are just whoa, you know, are they really saved? Are they really born again? So Paul pens this letter to the church, helping them to understand salvation. First thing he did is really help the Jews to understand that Moses' law never saved. Anybody. So keeping the law was not what was required for salvation. He used for the pinnacle of all of his illustrations, really the one that was the one that gave the argument that the law was necessary for salvation, the knockout blow. He used the illustration of Abraham in Genesis 15 when the Bible says Abraham believed God and his faith was counted to him for righteousness. And he illustrated that if Abraham were saved by faith, before Moses was ever born, then salvation could not be by obeying the law. Salvation had to be by faith. And so he illustrated to the Jews, you were saved by faith, the Gentiles were saved by faith, and so you're saved the same. 
spend some more time dealing with the law and helping understand uh, spiritual victory and really helps the Gentiles to understand in the previous chapters up to chapter 12 that God does have a future plan with Israel. Israel and the church aren't the same. What God is doing, what God is working through is not the same as what God is going to do someday when all Israel will be saved, shall be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now Paul is trying to help the believers in the church not only get along, but get God's work done. And friend, if anything could be more helpful than to learn how to get along with believers who aren't the same and to accomplish God's purpose in their lives, I think any church in the world could be helped by it. There's too much. There's too much of churches assembling on the basis of their common spiritual gift. We saw that a couple of weeks ago when we looked at spiritual gifts. You know, a lot of churches, people want to go to a church where everyone has their spiritual gift instead of gifts differing according to the grace of God. I know a lot of people, well, you know, I really feel gifted in this area, so I'm looking for a church. I'm thinking, no, you need a church that doesn't have that if you're gifted in that area. We're supposed to be different. God made us different and gifted us according to His grace that way so that we could be part. And it's laziness that wants a church to have your spiritual gift. More tragic than that is the common practice today of believers being racist. And I said it, racist. I can't stand racism in a church. The notion that somehow God saves a people group culturally as opposed to because of Christ. I can't stand a black church or a Hispanic church or a Jewish church or any church that only reaches one people group when we're one in Christ. Study Acts sometime and look at what God had to do to get the Jews at Jerusalem to preach the gospel to the Gentiles and for them to realize that we're one in Christ and that we are not to be culturally divided. We are to all come together on the basis of Bible truth. I've said, and I believe it with conviction for years, that every local body of believers ought to reflect what is surrounded uh, or the community that surrounds it with regard to its makeup. We don't have to say, well, you know, I mean, yeah, he, you know, he needs to go with these kind of people. No, 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 not at all, my friend. And, but that was one of the struggles, one of the things that was causing friction in the church at Rome. The Jews were having a tough time being around the Gentiles, and the Gentiles didn't like the Jews, trying to make them into Jews, and so they're not getting along. And if they're not getting along, what's happening? They're spending a lot of time dealing with things that aren't serving God and accomplishing God's purpose. And that's Romans 15. It's like, okay, guys, now we've given you the doctrine, we've given you the reasons why you can't be divided over all of the different things. But now I want to tell you something. This is how you serve God. This is, this is Now that you know this, this is what you do. This is how you live. Okay, so let's look at just a couple of things. First of all, in verse 1 of chapter 15, the Bible says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. When I was giving my illustration earlier, one of the things I did I, that I failed to mention when I said that yeah, when Romans 14 was talking about not talking about meat offered to idols was that the word for weak literally is a word for sick. And you and I probably know people that physically speaking cannot eat meat. Does anybody here know somebody physically speaking you're thinking about that can't eat meat? They cannot eat meat. All right? That is one direct application of the passage of Scripture. Literally, a person can't physically eat meat. Now, here's one of the funny things about those people. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, if you're one of those people, bear with me. Uh, let me make fun of you. You can make fun of me for different things as long as you don't tell me about it, and we'll be fine. Uh, you ever notice that somebody that finds out something that's beneficial to their health thinks that everybody needs that thing? <laughs> flaxseed. I don't know flax. What happened to flaxseed? Did it go away? Yes, sir. It was, I mean, it was the rage. Like eight years ago, wasn't it? I mean, flaxseed. I can't wait for the essential oils to go away. I've tried to cook with those things, and they're no good. And just, uh, but the, the flaxseed, remember that a couple years ago? I mean, everybody needed flaxseed. I know people that benefited from flaxseed. I mean, it helped them. But I'm not going to cram, like, pounds of flaxseed into my diet simply because it's good for you. In other words, I don't, and maybe you have the same weakness or sickness. One of the things that people that are vegan, 
or vegetarian, oftentimes, and I'm not picking, if you're vegan or vegetarian, I have no issue with you, I'll eat a vegan, vegetarian, I'll eat whatever garbage you want to set before me, and I'll be happy about it, I don't mind it at all, okay, but um, I've noticed that most people that are vegan or vegetarian usually became vegan or vegetarian because of a health reason, in other words, it, it literally was good for them and helped them. Now, they can sometimes be obnoxious in thinking that everybody around them has the same health need. You know what I'm talking about? It's like, man, you know, eat tofu. I don't need to, okay? Uh, I don't think tofu is good for anybody, but I could be wrong about that. I'm not a scientist today. So, uh, anyway, you understand my point today. Of course, what the Bible is talking about here is actually this person is fully persuaded in their mind that this is best for them. And one of the applications for them is that it really physically is good for their health. I'm going to tell you something. Some things I eat do affect me. Sometimes I realize, you know what, I shouldn't eat that. That affects me. Sugar. Sugar is really not good for me. Uh, I, I consume too much sugar, and it's addictive and all that, but it really isn't good for me. I don't feel good when I have too much sugar. You know, I don't think that everybody everywhere shouldn't have sugar, but it isn't good for me. Uh, you understand what I'm saying? You understand what we're getting at? Uh, different people have different needs, and if they're fully persuaded about it, it's not just a spiritual thing, it's a real thing. And the Bible says, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. So if you're physically able to eat meat, that's okay. Put up with people that can't. That really is really is what the Scripture is saying here. If you're Jewish or you're Gentile, and this is something you're persuaded about, how are you supposed to treat each other? We literally are talking about meat and herbs. That's the context. Some people believe herbs. God didn't make herbs. God didn't create us to eat meat. Yeah, but look at these teeth I got right here. See these things? After the flood, I grew big time fangs. And so, okay, I'm only, I, I should quit being silly. All right. Uh, the reality of it is, is that, you know, I know, hear people make that argument. You know, the fact of the matter is, is that it's possible, I think, to have an herb diet that's good for you. It's possible, I think, to have a balanced diet that's not only herbs, that's good for you as well. The Bible says in verse 2, let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. You know, a lot of times the things that really hurt and harm people are entirely unnecessary. Just not necessary. Okay, if somebody is convinced that they need to be vegan, what are the spiritual ramifications of that? None at all. I heard Christians fight over it. Why would you fight over something that has no spiritual ramification? Why would you? It's one thing to tease. If people can be teased, it doesn't hurt them. That's another thing to really think thoughts about people. You shouldn't or should or whatever. About something that has no spiritual ramification at all. It doesn't even matter. And it's true about a lot of things. Fords and Chevys. I've almost quit joking about Fords and Chevys. I remember when I was in college, I remember having feelings about people who talk too much about Fords. I'm thinking, what an idiot. They obviously aren't mechanics. I worked as a mechanic, you know. Playing your Ford guy, I'm picking on you. That's the right answer. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, if you're a mechanic and you like Fords, you know, there's no such thing. There's a mechanic that likes Fords because I remember this, Ford Tauruses. My boss had 13, yeah, you have a Ford Taurus. You know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, I was dating a lady for a summer, and um, her parents had a Ford Taurus. And I told them it wasn't a good car. They, they liked them. So they asked my boss when I worked in the mechanic shop, they said, are Ford Tauruses? He said, what do you think about Ford Tauruses? And my boss said, I love them. Huh. And he said, look at my shop. i got 13 bays, eight of them, and any time I have Ford Tauruses in them. You know, and he said, I make a living on Ford Tauruses. I make great cars. You know, so hey, everything, you know, let him maybe fully persuade his own mind. My boss wouldn't drive them, but he liked them. So, <laughs> and it, so don't get offended me if you're a Ford person. Okay? That's, the point of this is, is that there are stupid things that people don't like people over. I mean, it's amazing what we unite over or we divide over, isn't it? You know, you have preachers who are golfers or fishermen. Now, I don't know why any sissy would want to go out on a golf course and swing. 
Or, yeah, you know, you understand what I'm talking about? Yeah, you know. Well, you know, I just go, I just go, I like to kill things. You know, you just, you just like to kill stuff. You know, why would you fight over something stupid like that? You know, why would you? you know, but people actually get pretty hurt or hurtful over things that are stupid. Did I say stupid? My wife's not in here. They get hurtful over things that there's no reason to be hurt over. And the Bible says, basically, hey, if you're strong, bear the infirmities of them that are weak. But ultimately, the point is, don't plead, don't try to do things for yourself. If you if you love Chevys, well, you're loyal to something that uh, God's not loyal to. If you love Fords, you're loyal to something God probably, no, I won't say. Uh, I don't have a Chevy anymore. I don't even own a Chevy. Okay, so you think I'm biased about it. I'm actually not. I, I drive VWs, diesels. I've got two VWs, and I've got a Dodge truck. And, and Ford trucks and Chevy trucks are better than Dodge trucks. So don't don't judge me too harshly here. Sorry, Dodge people. Verse 4. For whatsoever things were written before time were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Now, verse 5, the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. Now here's our first point this morning. We're, gonna, we're not going to go much further than this. We're supposed to be like-minded toward one to another in Christ Jesus. What is it that every one of us has in common? Jesus. Truthfully, background, personality, and just likes and dislikes, it's quite possible that most of us only have Jesus in common here today. I remember Brother Alex Lopez. I wish he'd move back here soon. But he's in Kentucky right now. But he used to say he's Filipino, got saved, I think he was 23. And uh, he used to say, if I weren't saved, I wouldn't like any of you guys. <laughs> we're all best friends. We're really close friends. Alex and Charlie are like best friends. But Alex would hate Charlie if he wasn't saved, wouldn't he, Alex? He wouldn't like you at all, would he? Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> It's really funny. It's like, if I weren't saved, I wouldn't like any of you. And that's it. I always thought, well, that's great because he really loves us. Alex does. And I thought, you know what? It's Jesus. It's Jesus that brings us together. So you can be a Gentile, and, uh, and there are things that you'll be okay with that I think a Jew just will never, they'll just always grate on their nerves. Just always bother them. But when you look to Jesus and you realize He's the same as I am and neither of us are worthy of Christ, all of a sudden it's like, wow, we're just the same. The fact of the matter is, every person who is born again in Christ Jesus has a common cause, a common purpose, and ought to have a common goal and ought to have like mine. I'll just be thinking the same. You know, it ought to be that when a believer in Jesus is spoken to, by God's Holy Spirit that other believers think that's exactly what God was saying to me. I love that. This evening we're having a church business meeting. I love business meetings. We never had a bad one in our church. We never had like, you know, uh, we'll have our 11-year anniversary in a week. We've never had an argument or dissent in a church meeting. But here's what we've had that is just, just downright supernatural. We've had God lead three or four people independently the same and come together and say, you know, I feel like this is what we should do. This is what we should pray for. These are the actions that we should take. And somebody else said, that's exactly what I was going to say. That's what I was thinking. Why is that? Well, because we're serving Jesus. And friend, if we're serving Jesus, if we're really serving Jesus, there's nothing about that that's going to divide us over anything. We're going to have a united commonality of purpose if we have the same purpose. Now, if we're going to try to entertain people, we're going to argue about it, aren't we? How many of y'all are? Uh, how many of you have an appreciation for Southern entertainment? I mean, Southern gospel. Go ahead, fess up. Yeah, raise your hands. Okay. Yeah. I don't appreciate that at all. <laughs> when I was in college, I went to a church, and they were very Southern, good, just wonderful people. And I remember during the song service, I remember like holding the pews like this until my knuckles turned white. I was like, hang on. These people, are, they're about to lift off here or something. They're crazy, you know. Uh, that's just not me. Those people love the Lord Jesus. And man, we serve together and we're great friends to this day. We're just, we're just you know, we're not the same culturally. But culture is the world. Right. Serving God is Jesus. Right. 
That's all there is to it. When we get focused on things like, well, you know, I think we should have this style or that style, we're focused on men and their preferences and what they want. And we've entirely missed the point of the church, which is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and to accomplish His purpose. And we'll be divided instead of united. I believe that there is a grand litmus, litmus test for whether a thing is biblical or isn't. Isn't it true? If it's biblical, it will unite believers who love Jesus. And if it's unbiblical, if it's just extra biblical, it means it's just kind of irrelevant biblically, people will just bicker and argue and separate over it and not love each other. So what is Paul saying? Paul's saying, focus on things that matter. Deal with things that matter. In verse 6 he said that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. What God is called cleansed, call thou not common, is what the Holy Spirit told Peter. We need to receive each other, love each other. It troubles me, it bothers me when somebody comes and points out that another believer is different. I love the I love the saying. I think it's just universally true that either everyone is normal or no one is. I just think it's really true. In other words, if you think I'm weird, it's just because you're weird. You know? Because we're different. We're just different. We think that anybody that's not like us is wrong or different. But the Bible says that we're supposed to receive one another. If somebody has an oddity, whether it's a personality, shall we call it a glitch? whether somebody has a mannerism or a behavior. How are you supposed to treat them? Well, the Bible says that you're supposed to receive them. And the idea of receive means to embrace. Literally is family. This is, this is what I like, what I love. You know, I found in practicing this that the very thing which is annoying becomes endearing. It's really true. People talk about you sometimes to me. I have a visitor at our church, and they'll come and they'll ask me about one of you, and they'll say, have you noticed that that lady does? And I always smile, I'm like, yeah, that's, that's right, I like that, don't you? <laughs> have you ever noticed that person does? I'm like, yeah, I know it. That's one of the things that makes them special. And it really is true. And you realize, you know, I just, in my mind, I think, yeah, they, they like it about that person. But actually, they probably don't like it. But the fact that it is, and it's because it's my brother or my sister, I think it's great. And that's the idea. That's the mindset here. Of course, friend, we're not united over common likes and dislikes, interest and disinterest. We're united over a common cause, and that's Jesus Christ and God's glory. The Bible says, Wherefore we receive you one another, as Christ also hath received us, or also received us, to the glory of God. And now Paul's just going to conclude with the Jews and Gentiles. In verse 8 he said, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the church of, for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Who, what group is Paul addressing in the church at Rome in verse 8? the Jews. He said Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Who are the promises to the fathers to? What people group? The Jews. When Jesus came, whose Messiah was he? Whose? The Jews' Messiah. Who's else? Who, who else? The Gentiles as well. Look at verse 9. And he said, in that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy. I love the phrase that Paul uses, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. In other words, the Gentiles just don't belong. And that's why it's so weird to have them in the church, actually. They're aliens. Yeah. I don't know what kind of a, uh, image that invokes in your mind. 
But I just think of like the Jewish church and then having all these aliens invading them. And that literally, that literally is what it was for the Jewish believers in the church at Rome. They felt invaded. Whose fault? Well, they preached the gospel to the Gentiles. But they were uncomfortable when the Gentiles got saved and began to come into the church. But the Bible said that the reason that the aliens or the Gentiles were allowed into the church was so that God could be glorified for His mercy. What kind of a God would save Jews and send Gentiles to hell? You could say it because He isn't that kind of a God. He would be a cruel, unjust, unloving God. The Bible says in verse 9, for this cause, this is Psalm 18, 9, 2 Samuel 22, 50, uh, that's written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing it unto thy name. And again, he saith, this is Deuteronomy 32, 4, rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. Now this is fantastic, isn't it? Especially if you happen to be predominantly Gentile as in mine. Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. In other words, come on in. You can have everything that God is to us. You can have the benefits of being Jewish. I used to wonder, you know, if I'm Jewish, what tribe am I? Well, what tribe was Jesus? Judah. Judah. Yeah, I'm from the tribe of Judah, Amen. actually. Isn't that wonderful? Read, read Galatians sometime if you don't believe me. It's amazing. Isn't that amazing? I got adopted in. Adopted in. Most of us could say that. At the very least, every one of us could say, yes, I was one of the branches that was cut off and have been grafted back into the true tree. Isn't that wonderful? Verse 11, again, praise, you, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. You see this, the inclusiveness of the scripture here? Praise the Lord, ye Gentiles, and praise him, all ye people. And again, Isaiah said, saith, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him shall the Gentiles trust. And here's our conclusion this morning. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. So how ought we to feel about God's plan? You're Jewish, and God opened the door and let the Gentiles in. You ought to rejoice in the joy and the hope. You ought to realize, man, God's good. You're Gentiles, and you got in the door. You ought to rejoice in the hope. And that ought to be something that makes all of us say, God is amazing. God's power, God's purpose is incredible. You know what we like to do instead? In our flesh, I think we like to pick. We like to look at people and look at them with eyes that are seeing themselves as more loved by God than others. And my friend, there just isn't any such thing. And I believe, practically speaking, that it's very simple for us to be able to take what the Scripture has said today and apply it. And ask the question, am I offending for the sake of the gospel? Or am I offending just because I don't love people the way Jesus does? It's a pretty good question. I've had people offended before. And there's been times when I thought that was entirely unnecessary. I've offended people before and thought, you know, there's no reason to offend anybody. I'm sorry, you Taurus people. I apologize. There's no reason for that. God doesn't care if you're a vegan. He really doesn't if you're fully persuaded that that's right. It's not a matter of, oh, I think something evil is good for me. No, the Bible says evil is evil. It says one of them to call evil good. We're not talking about, well, I think it's okay to be immoral. Uh, no, no, we're talking about this is something that I believe is God's best for me. This is what God wants. And if you believe God wants it, my friend, you'd be an unfaithful servant. You would be disloyal and dishonest to practice otherwise. And as a believer, if God hasn't shown me the same thing, and if God isn't going to show me the same thing, the manner in which I treat you for something God has shown you ought to be with deference. And ought to practically be that, well, if that's what God's shown them, then that's good for me. I'll close with this illustration. This happened early in our church. And it was something that was a little burdensome to me. Uh, this would be about around, I want to say, 2000. 
2008, and um, we were on the in our church in Federal Highway where we were for our first eight years before we purchased this building. And after the evening service Sunday night, all of us would go down the street a ways to the McDonald's, and they had 59 cent hamburgers, 69 cent cheeseburgers. And we would go there at, at, to McDonald's, and one of us usually would just buy a massive tray of cheeseburgers and try to poison everyone else with them. <laughs> and uh, I literally, like our whole church, went down to McDonald's every night. It was a lot of fun. And Mike Huckabee uh, started a show, whatever it was, on Fox News. And Fox News was always playing at McDonald's, and Mike Huckabee was on. And so we would eat cheeseburgers and watch Mike Huckabee. I don't mean to be offensive to you if, you, if it bothers you that we saw Mike Huckabee at McDonald's on Sunday evenings. Okay, but this is what happened. But somebody was offended by it. Somebody said, you know, I just don't think it's in the spirit of worship to go to McDonald's after church on Sunday night. And they called a special meeting. I thought, what in the world is wrong? They asked to meet with me. I need to meet with you about something. And they, and they told me, I, said, I just don't think it's in the spirit of worship to go to McDonald's on Sunday nights and watch Mike Huckabee and eat cheeseburgers. I didn't know what to say. Well, I said, well, well, what's wrong with it? Well, it just really bothers me. It's really a nebulous answer, actually. And I uh, thought about it. And I looked at the person that said that to me, and I thought, you know, you really are bothered by this. It really does bother them. Or making it up. There's something about it frustrated or troubled them. And I don't know exactly what it was. But it, it, it apparently wasn't good for them to go to McDonald's on Sunday evening. So you know what we did? We quit going to McDonald's Sunday nights and watching Mike Huckabee until that person left the church and then we went back to McDonald's again. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then they changed their special. And so we don't go down because they don't have the 59 cent cheeseburgers anymore. Was it 39 cent hand? It was, it was, they were cheap. You could buy piles of them. It's enough to just kill yourself. Do you understand the spirit of what we're saying? In other words, any person that God loves ought to be more valuable to me and ought to be mean more to you than any preference that we have. And so let me give you two last things by way of application then. If you have an infirmity, don't cover it up. Don't hide it. You know, sometimes people are offended and other Christians don't even know that they've offended someone. They don't even realize. If you have something and you say, well, I don't want to be considered weak. I don't want to be looked at as Weak. Well, the word isn't weak. The word really is sick or an infirmity. It means you legitimately have something, and it's this is not good for me. Do you think that there are things that people who have struggled from sins in the past shouldn't see? Maybe another person wouldn't notice, wouldn't realize, but it would be harmful for someone else to see it. That's legitimate, isn't it? Do you think that there would be triggers for people who've struggled with sins of the flesh, of things that just are said, maybe even phrases or innocent expressions that could hurt someone? Of course. You know, as believers, we're so ready to defend our right to do something. We call it Christian liberty. You're going to rob me of my liberty. When we really ought to think along the lines of it's always wrong for me to offend a brother or to hurt a brother or harm somebody that Jesus loved enough to die for him. I love it when you say if God loves him so do I. And it's just a, that's just about as good of a mindset as we can have for receiving each other. And if we'll do that my friend we'll be unified in purpose We'll encourage each other, we'll encourage one another, and ultimately, God will be glorified, and more of the lost will see Jesus. Because we'll preach it instead of preaching our pet peeves and our differences. Father, I pray that you would help us to believe your word this morning. God, I ask in particular that you would unite this people, this church, to love one another so that God can be glorified and the lost can be reached. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a moment. We're going to have an invitation this morning.
Imitation is really simple. It's not over dramatized in our church, and we certainly don't have uh, any. What we do has nothing to do with how someone else would do something. We're gonna we're gonna sing a song, page two forty six, the blue hymn book, softly and tenderly. And while we have that song, that's a song of invitation. While we sing the song, we're actually going to invite you that if God has shown you something, God has opened your eyes to something in particular, or He's put His finger on something, or in a circumstance or something that you've done or something that isn't right in your heart. God did not speak to you so that your intellect can be tickled. God spoke to you so that you could say, yes, Lord. And it's as simple as that. And so the invitation is actually a time in our service when we invite you. If God's, God spoke to your heart, right where you're sitting at, you just go to God and say, yes, God, I'm going to respond. And maybe there's specifics. Maybe there's things where God says, this shouldn't be in your life. Or this ought to be in your life. And if there are specifics, then deal specifically with God about that. Brother Taj is in the back of the room, and he's there with the Bible, so that if anyone here today would say, you know, Pastor, you talk about Jews and Gentiles all being part of this church, this body, but I'm not part of it at all because I don't, I don't, I mean, I, I go to church, but I don't know Jesus personally. God is not my God. The Spirit of God doesn't live in me. My friend, we can show you from the Bible how simple it is to just recognize what the Bible says, that all sin comes short of the glory of God. To, to respond to the fact that Jesus, who was God's perfect Son, died on the cross for sin, even though Himself, He'd never sinned. And to simply respond God's way by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus. My friend, the Gospel is simple. God, I know, I know that I'm a sinner. I know Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And I'm asking You to save me because of it. You don't have to be a biblical scholar to receive Jesus as your Savior. There are a lot of things that you can learn and grow my friend, you have to recognize that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And you have to lift up Jesus. And so it might be during the invitation today, that would be the invitation for you. You don't know for sure that you're on your way to heaven. You've always thought that you're going to heaven because you've been part of an organization, a church, or uh, because you've always been open to God. My friend, you have to receive Jesus as your Savior. And you do so by asking God. And so that's the part of the invitation for you. I hope that's clear enough. And if you want to do business with God, you feel led, just go ahead and uh, remain seated when we begin to sing. Or uh, you feel free to kneel at your seat. Or if you need someone to pray with you, Brother Taj is available. That's the invitation in our church this morning. Please open your hymn books to page 246. And if you're physically able to do so, we please stand as we sing a song of invitation. <laughs> 